Hello. Uh, once we assumed that reason and rationality would gradually uncover the truth, but quantum mechanics to set theory, positivism to deconstruction, philosophical realism to philosophical relativism. It seems that paradox lies at the heart of our most revered theories and at the cornerstones of our thought. Are these paradoxes evidence that our theories are wrong? And is it essential that they are overcome? Joining us to discuss are Hilary Lawson, Hilary is a postmodern philosopher and critic of philosophical realism. He is the author of Reflexivity, the Postmodern Predicament and Closure. Sophie Allen is a lecturer in philosophy at Keele University. Her research focuses on metaphysics and the philosophy of science. And Slava Zizek, uh, joining us by the miraculous paradox of quantum physics, both in his kitchen in Ljubljana and in North London right now. He's a Slovenian-born political philosopher and the international director of the Birkbeck Institute of Humanities. So let's get things started. Hilary, I'm going to start with you. Are paradoxes evidence that our theories are wrong? And is it essential that they are overcome? There's something at least amiss with the way that we, uh, our theories operate. And I think it's essential that we do something about it. Uh, first of all, let's just be clear what we mean by paradox. It's a contradiction which applies to the claim itself in such a way that you cannot think the claim. So the classic example of this is the Cretan liar paradox, which in its contemporary form is probably most easily expressed as there is no truth. Now, in the claim there is no truth, it seems apparently straightforward. But it's not straightforward if you apply it to itself. Because if there is no truth, does it mean there is no truth, that there is no truth? Um, or, or in order to understand the sentence, do you in fact have to imagine it to say there is a truth, that there is no truth? In which case, you cannot think that idea. If you look up paradox in Wikipedia, it'll tell you this is a bit of a logical, technical, logical problem. And it's, it's uh, possibly been solved by Russell's theory of types and Tarski's hierarchy of languages. I don't buy either of those things. I don't think it's a little logical problem. It's found at the heart, I would argue, of all of the major philosophical systems of at least the 20th century and for uh, a good deal prior to that. And it comes in lots of different forms. They all have this self-referential problem right at the heart of the puzzle. So what's going on? Why do we find this? Uh, uh, at the center of our theories. And the sort of answer that I would give is something along these lines. That we imagine, or we, Western thought is in general imagine that we are describing a world of things out there um, and it's more or less accurate. A better way of understanding that would be to think that the world is other. It's not like language at all. Language divides things into things and it divides them into characteristics. But that's no reason to think that the world is divided into things and characteristics. It's like a metaphor for the world. But they don't enable us ever to describe the other that's out there. There's always an infinite gap between our ideas and the world. And it is in thinking that we might be able to close that gap and actually say how it is that we get into these uh, paradoxes. This account that I've given you, this story of closure, uh, you might say, well, aren't you claiming that that's true? The account that I've given is an attempt to describe why it's possible to describe the world, uh, why it's possible to say things and intervene in the world without it having to be true. It's very tantalizing. Thank you, Hilary. <laughs> Sophie Allen, are paradoxes evidence that our theories are wrong? And is it essential that they are overcome? OK, um, I'm sympathetic to quite a lot of what Hillary said there, but I'm going to disagree on some things. But what I'm going to do philosophically here is actually give you two views, two opposing views. And one side says that, OK, our theory, if you think your theories are about the world, if you think your theories are actually true, if you're a realist, then it's going to be a serious problem if um, paradoxes arise in your theory because that is actually telling you that th paradoxes arise in the world. That somehow, if your theory is correct, if your theory is the right one, that implies that actually the world is somehow contradictory. 
Now, that is a very difficult thing to understand. There are a couple of philosophers who accept that, who would actually quite persuasively argue that we can accept the existence of, con that some contradictions are true, or that some paradoxes could actually be manifested. Now, I'm not going to be one of those philosophers, but I'm just kind of throwing it out there. So, on the one hand, if you're a realist about theories and you think that our theories are actually about the world, the, the appearance of paradoxes are, is really problematic. On the other hand, if you take the view, it's perhaps similar to what um, Hillary's described, our theories are trying to model the world, they're trying to explain the world, they may not actually pick out what's actually in it. They may say things that we can, they may predict and explain what's going to happen, but they won't actually tell us what the world contains. In that case, a paradox is not quite as big a disaster when it appears in your theory. When you get a paradox appearing, you can actually look at things and say, OK, we're making, we're making a definitional mistake. We're making a conceptual mistake. Now, I think it's not possible to eliminate paradoxes entirely, but they are going to, they're going to appear, but I'm not sure it's inevitable that they'll appear. OK, wonderful. And Slavo Žižek, uh, are paradoxes evidence that our theories are wrong? And is it essential that they are overcome? Paradox, getting entangled in some precisely defined, not any inconsistencies, is maybe the only reliable proof that we are touching the real. I think that Hegel, in his phenomenology of spirit, basically repeats the same procedure again and again. He takes a certain, let's call it existential position, and he tries to demonstrate how, if you bring this position, if you think it or practice it to the end, it will, it will refute itself. It gets inconsistent. And I apologize in advance for the vulgarity of this example. <laughs> it's a horrible movie that I don't even like it. Four <laughs> weddings and a funeral. Yeah. <laughs> when Hugh Grant declares love to Andy McDowell. He did, does this in his affected way, you know, stumbling, self-interrupting, uh, interrupting himself all the time and so on. And it's clear what's the idea. It's that precisely through this inability to declare his love in a consistent, clear statement, that this very fact somehow demonstrates that his love is authentic. A subject always, in a way, fails to fully express himself or herself successfully. And it's this very failure, uh, uh, inability to do it, which makes you a subject. I don't think we should be afraid of paradoxes, but we should definitely not confuse, let's call, call them naively somehow, serious paradoxes with this cheap either deconstructionist jargon or whatever, where anything say when you don't know what to say clearly, you escape into cheap metaphorics and so on and so on. So again, as a Hegelian, I think that our very distance towards reality, I am not there, I cannot grasp the world, is a feature of the world itself. The world is in itself inconsistent and so on. Thank you. <laughs> Now, this is a paradox. How people could be so stupid to applaud to this miserable improvisation? <laughs> oh my God, I cannot get out of it, sorry. <laughs> And they're cheering even more. I want us to develop our arguments a little bit. So we, we may be able to work around paradoxes and they may even drive our progress or our sense of human subjectivity. But why are they so common to begin with? Why is paradox found at the heart of so many of our core theories? Uh, Slava, can I start with you? Why is the paradox so prevalent? I know that something happened to simplify it. I hope we will agree here in the Western thought, let's say towards the end of 19th century and later, two names pop out. Of course, Cantor and his theory of sets, of multitude of infinities, and so on and so on. And of course, I'm almost ashamed to mention it, Kurt Gödel and so on and so on, all that. Something changed here. But nonetheless, let's not forget that already at the beginning of Western thought, let's take Plato Parmenides. 
how to read it. For some, this is just a funny logical exercise. It's not serious thought in the sense of saying something about reality. Others read it as a theological treatise. It means our reasoning is too limited. The only contact with the absolute is some uh, intuitive immersion into one all and so on and so on. But I think this can be read also in a different way. That what if the inconsistency of different ontological positions described by Parmenides does touch something in reality? I mean, Slava's examples are always wonderfully entertaining, but I, I'd like... But, uh, go to bat. I see but, you sharpening your knife. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I'd, but I'd like to try and frame what, what it seems to me is going on here. Uh, the Hegelian move is to embed the paradox or the contradiction in reality. It's to say, okay, we do come across these, these, uh, uh, these paradoxes. Indeed, if you try to think anything, you always uncover uh, the failure of that thinking. Uh, and to solve that with the Hegelian structure of thesis and antithesis. Now, that is a perfectly plausible move in response to uh, the paradoxes. I, I would... Uh, the framework that I've offered to you is one which says um, uh, the idea that uh, reality uh, is something in particular is something that we should give up. And I'm uncomfortable with the idea of saying that contradiction is written into reality. I, I don't, can't get my head around what that means to say I, pref I, I am more comfortable with the idea of saying we get these contradictions if we think that reality is something in particular. And if we examine any of our closures, they will always fail. That's why Derrida is in this situation, why deconstruction works, is because you can always examine any concept and show its failure. So I agree with Slavo in that. We both share that. But I don't want to make the move of saying, actually, we've got these contradictions, and I'm going to write it into reality. I don't... I, I don't buy that. I, I think that uh, we want an account which explains, uh, gives an account of why we get these paradoxes and enables us to make sense of the world and nevertheless. Sophie, do you want to come in? I find it conceptually difficult to think of the paradox being written into reality in some way. But I can see that I can be sympathetic to the point that there are certain things we still don't, really basic things we don't really understand. There are certain things in pre-Socratic philosophy which were really mysterious and paradoxical, dare I say, to them. The way that pre-Socratics thought about change was such that many of them thought change must be just impossible because it involved opposites. It involved hot turning into cold and um, wet turning into dry and so on. Now, we would not think of it like that. We'd have changed, we've changed our conceptual... We don't say, oh, yeah, well, there's really some kind of contradiction in reality and this is what's going on. We would take the view that actually, well, it's a continuum between hot and cold. And actually, we needed to change and start talking about temperatures. But nevertheless, our current theories have um, certain aspects to them, which are as mysterious, I think, as um, the, the sort of pre-Socratic change example. So, um, but I, I'm tempted not to draw, bring it into reality and sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I briefly reply to this? What I wanted to say is that uh, back to Hillary's point, you know, first, uh, be careful not to fall into the usual image of Hegel. Like, do you know that? It's a nice paradox. As far as I know, Hegel never uses the term thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I think it was his pupil Rosenkrantz, I think. I may be wrong to introduce it. But I totally agree with both of your points that there is something that doesn't function wrong, obviously misleading, in the idea that there are contradictions in reality itself. What I would have said here is that we should change our notion of reality. What if reality in itself is not in itself in the sense of some consistent reality, full reality out there being uh, fully ontologically constituting and waiting for us to discover it slowly. I'm, I think that reality in itself is, in some sense, ontologically unfinished, open. Their quantum physics, uh, wasn't this the 
secret clash or not so secret between Heisenberg and Bohr. For Heisenberg, uh, uh, this indeterminacy, you cannot measure, uh, measure, measure velocity, velocity position of a particle, still means we just cannot measure it. For Bohr, it was that in itself, particles don't have. So according to quantum physics, basically, the world resembles a badly uh, uh, programmed video game. If you play a video game and you see forests in the back, every tree is not programmed in detail because it's meaningless. And my cynical reading would have been that the lesson of quantum physics is that, as you say in English, we humans were maybe God when he created, I'm an atheist, the universe, thought, oh, humans are too stupid to get beyond the threshold of atom, so I will not plan it in detail. Like, we, as it were, got God himself by his pants down. We were a little bit too bright for God. This was, I think, the true conflict even between Niels Bohr and, uh, and uh, Einstein. Uh, this is what bothered Einstein so much. So would you agree to both of you? Uh, what I would ask is that we should also if we want to avoid some crude, simple realism, to accept that while I'm not a solid cis, no, we don't create reality, but reality is not simply out there, fully ontologically constituted, some mysterious beyond waiting for us to be discovered. That's what I would deny. Wonderful, but I want to use that to, to segue into our next theme, which is Precisely this idea about whether we... But, sorry, couldn't you allow the guy, the guy Hillary to... He wants to strike back. I feel his negative yeah. energy, as yeah. they would have said in Star Wars, yeah. I mean. But I'll usher him in, so get your boxing gloves ready. Um, but so this idea, do we need a new reality or is there a way of finding our way out of paradox if we think or reason hard enough, Sophie? I s can see Slavoj's point that... There there's a sense in which we don't know what we're, we don't know what we're looking at. Um, so it's difficult. I can't make a sort of claim that, yes, we're always going to reason our way out of uh, whatever paradoxes we encounter. We're quite good at reasoning our way around paradoxes to develop theories that improve them or avoid them or just sort of deal with them. We're, we're quite ingenious at theorizing, and that, that's an interesting and sort of interesting feature about humans. But I think... I mean, some philosophers would, and especially in the past, in the sort of Enlightenment philosophers would have said, you know, nature is rational. We can understand, we're going to understand the world because it works according to orderly rational principles. And our rationality somehow keys into that. And so when we discover a paradox, it's just a temporary mistake because we'll be able to eventually work out exactly what's going on because we have the sort of intellectual power to do this. I don't think that, I think that's just too, um, that's just too convenient, really. I mean, it's just not something, we, the aim is to avoid paradoxes, but I don't know whether we're always going to be successful in doing so. And one of the interesting things with quantum theory, for instance, is that um, we discover that nature really isn't how we expected it to be. But now the actual result is a selection of different theories that sort of help to solve the problem or sort of try and interpret what's going on. So that there are at least sort of four viable contenders. If there are physicists in the audience, you'll go, oh, no, but there's only one because you'll have a favorite one. But if you look at sort of, you can postulate the many worlds hypothesis or you could postulate, you can go for the Copenhagen interpretation or you can have Bohm's interpretation, which actually tries to restore determinism back into the quantum system. And these are different theories which all work at the same way at an experimental level, or that's the aim of them. That's what we're trying to do. And that, so there's a sense in which we end up, I mean, we do end up saying, well, okay, our theories aren't really about reality at this point. None of them are entirely free of what might have been called the paradoxes that we sort of were worried about in the first place as well. There's quite a lukewarm defense of reason in one yeah, respect. Yeah. Um, but Hilary, I feel like, you, there isn't a defense of reason for you that you've, what do you think? Gosh, there are so many different bits <laughs> of this. Uh, I just, just on the point that Slava was making about the nature of reality, just to come back to that, because I think this is a really key thing. Yeah, which yeah. Is where, 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 where we uh, have a similar approach is that I would describe a reality as openness. So 
so we're both using the word open there, and I think we're probably trying to achieve the same sort of thing, actually, with it. Um, I, I am nervous, as, as I was saying before, of, of trying, trying to say what's going on in openness, um, in that I take from the Kantian problem that you can't, you can't think the limit of thought. You can't be on the other side of the limit. You, 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 there's a contradiction in that. So I think we just have to leave the stuff there as being open and then think about what we do with closure and what that enables us to do. Uh, on the quantum mechanics thing, just briefly, it seems to me the quantum mechanics story is that we, we have the observer, you know, we observers, we have the universe, if you like, and then you have the theory. You've got three bits. And, and, and um, uh, the problem is that if the observer is um, in the universe, you know, the th if you try, it, any, any complete theory has got to put the observer into the universe, otherwise it's not complete. It's not a complete account. So you've got to get the observer into the universe. And uh, people have had different ways of doing that. You know, um, uh, materialists try and do that by creating a monist thing in which you put the observer, the uh, theory, uh, and the universe in, in the one space. Uh, idealists uh, want to separate it so that they uh, put the uh, observer, the theory, and the universe in the subject. Uh, uh, linguistic, a uh, post-linguistic turn, people like Wittgenstein make it sometimes look as if what they're trying to do is put the universe and the, uh, uh, and the observer into language. Uh, they're all attempts to try and solve this problem that there are the, the different elements. And I think the, the, the reason that you, in each case, get the same sort of puzzle out at the end of it is because the universe isn't made of a series of bits which we might uncover with our observations. That's not the idea we've just made. Western thought is based on the idea there's something going on out there. We try and create a theory which somehow gets at it. And, and uh, I think that, that it doesn't do. What we do do is create uh, ways of intervening. We create tools that enable us to intervene. And we can make them better. I mean, if you have a car, you can think, um, is it a effective car? Does it get free from A to B? Well, uh, can I improve the wheels? You don't say, is it a true car? Uh, this is not a plausible idea, is it a true car? And I would say the same thing about thought and language. We don't say, is thought and language true? It's a way of doing stuff. It's a way of intervening in the world. And if we think of it like that, I think that we can at least make our theories a little bit uh, more, 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 make more sense of them. I'm not saying that in some sense we get to the bottom of them. There's always going to be failures to our closure. You know, it, our, our closures are never going to be the same thing as openness. There's an irretrievable gap, but we can at least make a bit more sense of what's going on. Slavoj. First, about quantum physics, it's a crazy reading, but I think all the attempts that were mentioned uh, 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 many worlds interpretation, uh, uh, worm and uh, string theory and so on. I think that there is still something so radical in quantum physics that we cannot translate in our spontaneous everyday ontology. And I think all these theories try desperately to translate it back into some kind of understandable for our common sense ontology. I don't think this works. Considering your Hillary's the openness and so on. Again, our difference is more subtle than it may appear. Yeah. I agree about your openness and so on. I'm just saying against Kant that it's not that there is some hidden transcendent reality out there and we should be open, our language is a closure, we cannot get at it. What if this openness, it's a legitimate hypothesis at least, is in reality is somehow in reality itself, that we should think reality itself as open, in itself, not just we humans are too limited and so on. You know, when I made that unfortunate uh, Hugh Grant example for weddings and so on, what I like is the idea that we have a limitation, we fail and so on. But limitation, and that's for me the core of subjectivity, it's not that there is some inner core that we cannot grasp and then we fail our limitation. What if 
limitation itself creates the wrong presupposition that there is something beyond. But there is nothing beyond. Maybe first there is the openness of limitation and then we put things into it, we project things into it. So for me, if there is transcendence, it's first an uh, abstract transcendence. We are limited. Yes, we are limited. But this limitation doesn't mean there is a universe out there which is wealthier and so on and so on. Of course, there are things out there. But basically, I think this is the big lesson of being human, that limitation itself is creative. Limitation itself uh, creates the space for discovering mystery, what is beyond, and so on, and so on. If you go directly at the thing, you miss it. That's why I question, I don't know how much it's speculation, is it to be serious, takenly or not? You know, all this dream about Neuralink, wired brain, uh, singularity, and so on, and so on. I don't know how seriously this is to be taken. But what... Uh, what the question I raise is, if I'm flirting with a lady, or isn't all the wealth of erotic interplay in limitation? I don't know what she really thinks, she doesn't know what I think, and we play these ambiguous games of hints, double entendre, which themselves create the erotic wealth. I cannot even imagine the vulgarity of it if I'm flirting with a lady and I'm directly wired to her brain. What happens there? Do you want to ask me, yes, please drag me to the bed? <laughs> what I want only to emphasize is what is for me the productive power of limitation. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there's another Hugh Grant film that can answer that question. Because you are, we're all in danger of violently agreeing with each other. I want you to think about the future a little bit. How should we respond to the paradoxical nature of reality? Um, if paradox is unavoidable, what do we do with our theories? How do we go forward? Hilary, do you want to take a, a stab at that question? Well, I, I do, <laughs> but of course I, I, I would just like to pick up on what Slavo was saying. Is it so, some advice so, on Slavo's so I, 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 I do appreciate the, the, your thought uh, there of what, not wanting openness to be some distant other. And in, in my own way, uh, I, would, I would want to say that as, as, as humans, we find ourselves on the cusp of openness and closure. And maybe in the vocabulary that I've been using, that is trying to do the same sort of thing that you are trying to do in not make it a, a distant, unattainable other, which I, I agree, I, I don't have much sympathy uh, with. Um, sorry. But so, as to the future, how do we proceed? Well, uh, I... With our paradoxical reality? Well, our... I, I think that we have to give up on the fantasy of the real. I think there's a very, you know, very big consequence. Uh, I think that although we've somehow, people have adopted perspe uh, a perspectival view, they cling to the idea that you have these different perspectives, but some single reality that you have a perspective of. I, I, I don't buy this. I, I think that what we learn from these paradoxes is that we have to give up the idea that what our, our metaphors for the world do is describe a single thing and that there might be a correct answer, and instead to operate in a different sort of framework in which we think of the world as being open and one that we close in order to do different things. And we disagree about how we close things because we want to do different things in it. But I don't think we should think that any one of us has somehow worked out what's really going on. Sophie? <laughs> I've noticed with many of the paradoxes, although some of Slavoj's weren't exactly about this, but many of our sorts of scientific examples of paradoxes have been in cases where we're trying to explain everything. And if you try and explain everything, this is where you get a self-referential problem because you're using a theory to explain itself. The theory has to be contained. It has to be explained by itself. And I think part of the difficulty is actually to be able to separate maybe t take a different view on what, what, we, what status we give our theories, what we think our theories are, and actually think, well, okay, they're not going to explain, we're not going to have a theory of everything. We're going to have a restricted, we might have a sort of 
or a theory of almost everything, but probably not a theory of everything, because we're going to keep running up against this problem that if you try to explain something by using itself, we haven't really come up with anything that, that can do that. Or, or we have to accept that the paradox, we have to accept the paradoxes will just arise. Um, I'm tempted to disagree here with Hillary though about the nature of um, the real. I mean, I agree that theories aren't really, I'm not really a realist about what our theories are describing. I don't think our theories are actually describing, picking out separate things. But I think we are in some sense trying to describe the same thing. I think the sort of nature of language, the way language works, sort of requires that intersubjectively we're, we're involved in the same, we, we exist in the same world in some way. So I think there's a sense, there's some kind of strong sense in which there's, I, I have to see people as existing in a world and think, trying to talk about it in the same way I'm trying to talk about it. Slavo, I feel like you will have a suggestion as to how we proceed with our paradox. No, first I must tell you, basically at some level I agree with both of you uh, how you describe in a very fine way this cheap way of just, of just localizing paradoxes. Okay, we accept the paradox, it's over, the problem disappears and so on. So I'm here for a kind of a very naive approach. There are everyday paradoxes which are it is very naive what I will say, which are the result of the laziness of our thought. You, in order to, that would be my formula, naive one, in order to arrive at the true paradoxes, you have to work very hard with all your reason to get rid of the ordinary, everyday, common sense paradoxes. That would have been my formula. And I totally agree with you that we should avoid this Keep it's okay, okay, that's a paradox there, let's go on. Many theologists wanted to do this. My favorite Catholic theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, said, okay, God is a mystery, paradox is there, so let's focus on our rational world and so on, to localize the paradox. Second thing, I love the term introduced by, I will probably use it, but I will put a proper footnote, uh, that <laughs> theory of almost everything, you know, that's not quite, but... Oh, and again, my point would be my usual paradox that it's not that something escaped, but what if there is no everything in this mystical realist sense? What if reality is in itself, I cannot develop it now, uh, is in itself almost everything? And although I'm an atheist, just the last theological conclusion, you know, famous Einstein's reproach to Bohr when he said... Uh, Whatever God does, God doesn't play games. God doesn't cheat. The lesson of the ultimate paradoxes of quantum physics, how things can happen in that in-between area with virtual elements who, without fully existing, can have effects, is that maybe God doesn't cheat, but we or reality itself cheats on God all the time. If by God we mean the universal rational order of reality, the lesson of quantum physics is that there are things which escape God. If again, by God we mean order of uh, uh, rationality and so on and so on. All where I hope we agree, and you Hillary also, I don't think you go in this direction, namely if I am in danger of being disqualified as a naive Hegelian in the sense of, yeah, yeah, contradictions are in reality, what's the problem? I hope you will also reject being identified as this simple postmodernist. Didn't you uh, uh, characterize yourself as post-postmodern? No? I don't buy this idea of, oh, there is no reality, what's the problem? There are just multiple language games, everything is... I think that if there is a paradoxical inconsistent position, it is the position of Everything is just a discursive construct, historically relative, and so on and so on. It's a way too simple position. A true acceptance of what you call openness would include, I think, rejecting this simple, sim let's call it simple postmodernist. And a question, final one, to both of you. Would you agree that in the postmodern era, deconstructionist era, thinkers in a way too easy way 
avoided the big ontological questions. For example, if you ask some big deconstructionist, like not so much Derrida as Foucault, do we have a mortal, immortal soul? His answer would have been something like, I can only describe the discourse, the episteme, within which you can raise this question. Like, you no longer address the big metaphysical questions. All you do is to describe the historical horizon of knowledge, and then there are different horizons, and so on and so on. I don't think this should be our ultimate horizon, that all that we shouldn't ask big metaphysical questions, we should ask them, I claim. Not in a naive way with all the paradoxes, but a return to basic philosophy is needed. Don't you think, Hillary, would you accept that at some point, a closure can also be a great productive thing? I wouldn't just denigrate closures. Let me take, as an old greedy obsessed with sex man, let me take sexuality. You have a beautiful body of your partner. You are thrilled with it. Can you imagine how much closure is in it? I mean, you know that already medieval theology to cure you from your sexual desire set, just change your perspective. Imagine all the dirty things just going on beneath the skin of a beautiful body, cheat indigestion and so on, all that. Eroticism is based on an extreme closure. You limit your perspective. So would you agree that, again, let's not just denigrate closure. Yes, there is something uh, extremely productive, great in closure. Yeah. And, and more than that, I would say, you know, we have to have closure in order to be able to do anything at all. Yeah, we yeah, have to have those closures. It, you know, if we, if we were just in openness, we, we, we would have no way of being able to achieve anything. So, yes, of course, we, we have to have closure. And I also would, I think this is what you were saying. I, I also think that somehow we have, in a, openness is in a sense part of our experience. You, you refer, you know, in, in, to an erotic space. I think one of the interesting things you think about erotic space is it's very hard to describe. You can describe the headline situations, but actually to get into the detail of what it's like to be in that space becomes sort of impossible. And I think that's because when we're properly in the erotic space, we are with being, we are with our being, and we can't find words to get at that somehow. So um, I don't know whether that's <laughs> taking us off no, in a different we've direction. We've digressed enormously. We have. we have run out of time. All I can say is, Slavo, I think less love actually and more Paddington Bear too for you. Um, but um, you've been, haven't they been a marvellous audience? Please do join me in giving them an enormous round of applause. Sophie Allen, Father Hugo, and Hilary Lawson.